Technology has had an ever-changing effect on human history. Its evolution has had an ever-changing effect on our life experiences. Scientific know-how has changed our analytical and physical world and has jettisoned our modern society toward a faster and seemingly more efficient digital universe. A good example of our digital revolution is how humans have evolved in the field of communications. We have ping-ponged from smoke signals and handwritten letters to the revolution of the printing press, and each new stage of development has had a major impact on society. There are companies on the leading edge of this technology who are creating a monetary revolution. Companies such as Coindesk report on the trends and the ebb and flow on cryptocurrency. I'm Elise Fabin. I am Managing Editor at Coindesk. Okay, um, so Coindesk is a news and information website, so we cover um, primarily Bitcoin, but then also um, developments just generally within kind of the cryptocurrency and blockchain technology space. Um, so there are a few benefits to, to owning Bitcoin. Some people have invested in them just purely as, a, as an investment, so they're hoping that they'll appreciate in value and they can obviously make money from them that way. Um, but other people use it because they see the utility as a kind of payment platform or they, they see that they enjoy the kind of um, transaction technology that, that it, it comes with. The subject of Bitcoin is discussed amongst academic schools like King's College in Lower Manhattan. The Digital Roundtable is an open floor discussion event that focuses on the benefits and possible uses of the Bitcoin technology. One question asked is, how does Bitcoin help with democratization of the monetary process? How will that change the paradigm, give ownership back to the people here and around the world, and alleviate financial tension? Exchange, most people would agree, started with bartering. And so that was the ultimate uh, democratization of money. There wasn't any money, and so if you wanted something, you grew wheat, you had to go to the shoemaker and say, if you, if you need wheat, I'll give you X, X bushels in exchange Will you make me some shoes. And so money was in control of the people because the money at the time was commodities trading, basically. And it wasn't until that people figured out that certain things were rare. And some of those rare things were metals that were durable and that could be made uh, because they had value in them, like uh, gold. So this is a one ounce gold coin. Is that real? It's real, it's real gold. Mm -hmm. And it was made back when the gold standard cost $20 an ounce. And so a $20 coin had one ounce of gold in it because it was worth $20. Mm -hmm. And that's where the government started coming in and said, we're going to we're going to take that away from the people and centralize it and standardize it so that we make the coins consistently uh, and if we have a certain branding reputation for being honest then people will know that this is one ounce so they don't have to test it every single time you have a transaction and so governments have assumed then the trusted authority in determining the value of currency well, that began to degrade when, uh, during World War II, there wasn't enough gold to create enough money to pay for all the things that needed to be built in order to win the war. And so Roosevelt took us off the gold standard, and we went to what's now known as the Commodities Exchange Standard. So there was gold in the bank, but now we have paper bills that say, uh, you can redeem this for $10 worth of gold. And eventually, the redemption part went away, and what determined value for currency is called government fiat. It's by government order or their fiat that tells you legally you have no choice to accept this paper bill as one dollar because the government tells you you have to accept it as a dollar. And that's then when you migrate into, when you start printing money haphazardly, uh, that fiat currency can be devalued because it's not linked necessarily to anything of value. And uh, can anyone uh, name the highest denominated bill that was ever in circulation worldwide? Does anyone know what that is? Yes. Yes. What? Yes. This is a $100 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. So what you have with Bitcoin that's so radical 
is because of its public ledger and the way the technology works is you now have a trusted third party that is not the government that can confirm the transaction. And therefore, you don't need the government anymore being that trusted third party. And what happens then over time is because governments have a monopoly, virtually all monopolies end up with similar behavior. They manipulate the price to keep it high. Um, they end up uh, using their uh, monopolistic power to keep that power through crony capitalist uh, um, relationships. And uh, they use that money for purposes other than a medium of exchange. The symbols that are put on a coin uh, promote the uh, power and image and values of a particular country. And, uh, and that is overlaid uh, when you, uh, it's overlaid on money, so you have the power and the money, and whoever has that, which is the country, then controls. And so there are a lot of other reasons then that money uh, is used in a non-democratized fashion that Bitcoin just blows apart because it provides that uh, independent third-party verification where you don't need government anymore. Helping to spread the technology and the use of Bitcoin amongst businesses, Coin.co is one of the startups taking the lead in digital finance and remittance. Hi, I'm Alex Waters. I run the company Coin.co, and we're a Bitcoin company. We help businesses try to understand the Bitcoin landscape and educate them about how Bitcoin can be useful uh, to businesses and organizations. Um, so I, gr I grew up here in New York, and uh, I, I've been programming since I was pretty little, um, studied software engineering at RIT, and I've been doing um, management and, and, and development um, of software products in, in New York for about 10 years. Um, I got involved with Bitcoin really early on in uh, working on the open source project, and I attended the first Bitcoin conference, and um, it's sort of taken me by hold. Um, I guess I, I always had an interest in cryptology, and Bitcoin seemed to be the most interesting thing. Um, and so I started working on it, and it's, it's taken hold of me over the past five years. And so um, I hope to work on it for a long time, and uh, I'm really passionate about it. Coin.co is a Bitcoin payments company. We help businesses accept Bitcoin but receive US dollar. We also help companies understand the Bitcoin landscape and build products for their existing uh, business line. I've been working on Bitcoin for about five years. I worked on core development. I oversaw operations and development at BitInstant. I um, started an incubator here in New York and um, have built several companies since then. Um, but currently, I'm the CEO, CEO of Coin.co. I don't think we can classify Bitcoin as a, as a commodity or as a currency. I think placing a, a sort of label on it is, is difficult. And it, in some contexts, it, it fits the same description. Um, but it's, it's such a new thing, it's sort of like, um, you know, and this happens with all technology. When, when cars c came out, they were called the, uh, the horseless uh, buggy or, um, you know, so it's hard to sort of label it as something we're already familiar with because it's entirely different. These large financial institutions realize that Bitcoin is a powerful technology. And I think it's taken some, uh, uh, some time to get to that place. Uh, there was a period where the public opinion of Bitcoin was sort of misinformed and that's changing now and it's being taken more seriously and so therefore you see uh, large organizations investing in research development and just exploring um, the possibilities of the new tech. You know when Bill Gates was on Letterman I think for his first appearance there he was explaining the internet and they were the audience and, and David Letterman were kind of laughing at him saying well why would people use why aren't people going to just send letters to each other or use encyclopedias, why would they use this internet? And uh, so, I mean, in retrospect, that's kind of funny, and it, but, but that shows us that history repeats itself, right? Like, we right. can look at those examples and say, well, it's kind of taking this similar course here where people don't understand it and they sort of laugh it off, and then it slowly becomes ingrained in our lives. Bitcoin may be the future of money. Never before in the history of finance has there been a currency that is so flexible, transparent, and versatile like Bitcoin. Digital currency will ultimately replace physical cash as a means of exchange and enable a more free and open banking system. Technological innovations sometimes take time to grow and for the public to embrace. 
Acceptance sometimes takes time, and history will have the last word. The internet has imbued humankind with the power of information at its fingertips and has disrupted long-standing infrastructures like the music industry, commerce, communications, and now finance. The idea of a non-centralized open source money has had the potential to change our world and give new freedoms to individuals globally. The idea of a non-centralized open source economy has the potential to change our world and give new freedoms to individuals globally.